one of the messages that needs to be shared today is we really need to know what God wants from us. Because if we don't even know what God wants from us, how are we going to be able to please him? And so a few things I'm going to mention before we go into Romans chapter 12, which we're going to look at. A few things we need to look at. Uh, in Micah 6, 8, it says, what does God require of us? What does he want from us? It says, to do justly, love, mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's Micah 6, 8. Do justly, love, mercy, walk humbly. So, putting it in simple terms, the first thing is, we need to just make up our mind we're going to do the right thing in every single circumstance. That has to be established in our heart. It's called being a person of conviction. In other words, you're going to do the right thing every time. You have to make up your mind in advance you're going to do the right thing. The reason people give into temptation, the real reason, is because they didn't make up their mind ahead of time that they were gonna do the right thing. And so then, all of a sudden a temptation shows up and they say, wow, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know I was gonna do that. I didn't know I was gonna mess up. But making up your mind ahead of time, that's how it becomes established in your heart and mind that you're going to do the right thing. And this is, is so common that the tests are not always huge things, uh, just little things like being honest every day uh, in your life. And so if, let's say you went in a store and they gave you back too much change, and you could say, wow, God's really blessing me today. <laughs> or you can say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you gave me too much, here, let me give this back to you. Little things like that, the little things matter because if we, don't obey God on all these little things in our daily life, what happens to us? And I know it's happened to me before, and I made up my mind, no more of this. You start to slowly erode and lose your self-respect. When you don't do the right thing, you start to lose your self-respect. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. We don't do the right thing so that we can get into heaven. We do, the, we do the right thing because it's the right thing. Because if you don't do the right thing, you're gonna feel lousy. How many of you here today wanna to feel lousy? <laughs> but see, the enemy, it says that he's the deceiver, and so he, he tells us we can do something that isn't right, and it'll be okay, because it doesn't matter, nobody cares, it doesn't make any difference. But you know who it makes a difference for the most of all? Is you. And the reason is because you're the one who's going to look in the mirror when you get up. And if you don't like the person you see in the mirror, then you know that God's dealing with you. And God dealing with us is not a bad thing because it says that whoever the Lord loves, he corrects. Do you know the best way to get corrected is directly from the Holy Spirit? When the Lord tells you, wouldn't you prefer to just have the Lord tell you you're not doing something right? So usually this is how it works. And here's how the deal goes down. And I want you to understand this because I've watched this in people's lives. When we're off track or there's something in our life where we're not doing justly, and that means just not being the right way. Maybe we're not being fair, or maybe we're not being considerate, or maybe we're just being plain old fashioned selfish. But whatever it is that isn't right, the Holy Spirit will speak to us and say, that's not right, don't do that, stop it. He doesn't put us down, he just convicts us. The Holy Spirit is the convictor, not the condemner. And many people don't understand the difference. And some people don't want to be corrected because they don't want to feel bad about themselves. But it says that God's correction is an act of love. 
So when you get thoughts, uh, you know, I, I really ought to make this change. You know, I, I need to do better. God's always wanting us to rise higher and do better. And because he loves you, he'll correct you. The longer you go on with the Lord, the more correction you will receive. Because he knows you're maturing and you can handle it. But what happens if we ignore God and we ignore the correction when the Lord himself is talking to us? This is the funny part. He'll send people into our life to correct us. And sometimes they're not very nice. So my question is, would you rather just allow the Holy Spirit to correct you? It's called self-correcting. The Bible says if we would judge ourselves, this is in Corinthians chapter 11, if we would judge ourselves and self-correct, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we would judge ourselves. Sometimes it's just a bunch of things that we don't feel like doing. I'll give you an example. This morning when I got up, I went out in the driveway and I looked at my car and the left tire was extremely low on air. And I could have said, you know, this is not a convenient time to get my tire filled up with air. Maybe I'll just do it later. But why is God having me notice that first thing this morning? So that I'll say, I'll do it later? When God's having you notice something, he wants you to do something about it then. And so I got out the good old hand pump, put it on the tire, and I pumped up the tire by hand. And I could have said, I don't have time for that. I got to get to the church on time. That's stupid, isn't it? Because I could end up not getting there at all. My tire's low. But Jesus talked about that when he said there was a person on the side of the road that had been robbed and beaten up. And it says a priest walked by and said, well, that's too bad. But I'm on my way to church. Get me to the church on time. And he just left the guy there laying on the side of the road. You know the story. It's the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan stopped and did the right thing, even though it was inconvenient. And so sometimes when you do the right thing, you may not be on time everywhere you go. This is why we're not supposed to judge other people. It's better to do the right thing and be late than to be right on time and not doing the right thing. There's going to be times when you have to change and be flexible. But doing justly is huge. It's a huge thing in the Bible, Micah 6, 8, the first thing on the list, do justly. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. And that's only going to come from listening to the Holy Spirit. You're going to, you're going to know. Why does God have you notice when something's wrong? So you'll do something about it. So the next one in there, Micah 6, 8, and we'll get to Romans 12 soon, but Micah 6, 8 it says, love mercy. And this is a huge one, especially when we're angry or we're frustrated or we're fed up with somebody. Have you ever been fed up with somebody? See, this, this is... Loving mercy is showing continual kindness to people even when they don't deserve it. God says that the people who are kind to others even when they don't deserve it are called vessels of mercy. We also know there's people out there that like to go around and get on people's cases and correct them and be hard on people. Do you know what the Bible calls those people? Vessels of judgment. And some people are very proud of their ability to, to tell everybody else what they're doing wrong and get on their case and, and, and uh, just make other people you know, feel bad. They're proud that they're dictators or they're proud that they're strict. But the question is, is that what God said in Micah 6, 8? 
He said to do justly and love mercy. Jesus is the gentle giant. Jesus has all the power, and yet he's gentle and kind to others. So loving mercy doesn't just mean you, you, uh, well, I guess I better be mer merciful. I guess I, I, get, I guess I better be nice to this jerk. It's, it's not like that. You, you want to be kind. You love being kind. You love it. Because you understand what Jesus said, to treat others with kindness because that's how you would like to be treated. And um, walking humbly, that's the third one. Walking humbly with God. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Well, what, what does it mean to walk humbly? It just The Bible warns us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Because if things are going well, it's because God's holding it all together. And if, if God doesn't hold it together, it just all falls apart. It just all falls apart. We don't think about that too much because if it's all holding together, we just think that's automatic. But do you know, it says in the Bible that God spoke to the waves and said, you only get to go this far. Have you ever wondered, if you sit on the beach and you meditate and you think about God, he'll blow your mind with simple truths because <laughs> you have to allow your mind to empty out and let the Lord speak to you. So I was sitting on the beach recently and uh, this time of year you go up to the beach and there's nobody there. So I was sitting there pretty much by myself and I was watching the waves come in and the waves go back and the waves come in and the waves go back. And I heard God speaking to me, he said, do you know why the waves go back? Why do the waves go back? They come, they're coming forward and they're going backwards. He said, the, the reason the waves are going back is because I commanded them to, I spoke to the waves to go back and they can only go so far unless I say otherwise. And then he said, the ocean is the breath of life. And if you listen to the ocean, the waves come in. And the waves go out. And the waves come in. And the waves come out. And he said, the breath I put in you, I commanded to breathe. And you are every second, just like those waves of the ocean, you're breathing in. And you're breathing out. The ocean waves are our breath, our spirit, our very next breath. God commanded our breath to breathe in and breathe out. Just like the waves we breathe in and we breathe out. But if God were to stop that command, our breath would stop. Our very next breath, we just... He just fall down dead, just like that. Your very next breath exists because God commanded it, commanded you to keep breathing. This is humbling information. If you know right now as you stand here that your very next breath, the very next second you breathe relies on the Lord, that's humbling. And then we don't get we don't get a chip on our shoulder walk around going, like, yeah, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Because the word of God says we do nothing without him. And he gave us the breath of life. That's what makes us alive. He breathed life into us. Now the creator of the universe who breathed life into you who your very next breath you rely on, it says that nothing is too difficult for him. With God, all things are possible. And so we need to put that same reliance on everything else. Think about how silly it is to think that everything's up to us. If I don't do it, it won't get done. That's not in the Bible. Did you know that's not in the Bible? 
It's all up to me. Everything's on me. No, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and your, and, and your, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you want to have a light load? Because Jesus said he'll give you a light load, but you have to change the way you think. If I realize, and if you realize, that your very next breath relies on God, why are we fretting and worrying about all this stuff that is really beyond our control? Why? It's a waste of time. And I'm talking about everything. Don't worry about the election. Just hand it over to God. And don't worry about it. And don't worry about your next breath. Most of the time, we're not even conscious. We're conscious that we're breathing. We don't even realize it. But those three things, doing justly, loving mercy, wanting to be kind, walking humbly with your God, and knowing that your life is in his hands, you can become free of all this all these cares. Jesus said that all these cares is what keeps us from God's best. And so now we go over to Romans chapter 12 and it talks more about what God wants from us. If you want to say, well, what's, what's the message today? What does God want from us? What does he want from us? Well, I just told you three things. What does the Lord require? Do justly. Love mercy, walk humbly. What else does he want? It says we're to walk in faith. This is very interesting because it says without faith you can't please God. Well, where does the faith come from? From what we're doing right now. It says faith comes by hearing God's word. And when you hear God's word, you know there are hundreds of promises in this book from God, hundreds and hundreds of promises that God will fulfill. But if we don't even know he's promised all these, these good things, then we miss out. So let me give an example. Jesus over and over again said, let your, not your heart be troubled. God promised, he said, I give you peace. That's a promise of God. He promised to give us peace. Not just temporary peace. Not world peace. In fact, Jesus even addressed that. He said, not as this world gives, do I give to you. He said, but I give you peace from the kingdom of and the peace from the kingdom is supernatural peace that will cast down all the negative stuff that's trying to come against you. And a lot of the negative stuff that's trying to come against us is all in our minds because we get thoughts, you know, usually the thoughts come from some, you see something bad on the news and then you think, well, what if something will you know, you see a tornado on the news. What if a tornado comes? What if a hurricane comes? What if an earthquake comes? What if cancer comes? You, you can go down the list. What if it doesn't happen? <coughs> Most of the things people fear are things that are never going to happen. That's a fact. And even the atheists know that to be true. But let's go to chapter 12 of Romans. And here it says what God wants us to do. And he's very, he's very clear. He says... Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So I, I love the fact that God says this is not unreasonable. He's saying for us to be a, a, a living sacrifice. Do you believe that you are the property of Jesus, that you were bought with the blood of Jesus when he shed his blood on the cross. Because if you belong to Jesus, then we should start living like we belong to Jesus. And it's good to check your plans with the master. But I know a lot of, 
Christians, they just kind of just randomly do whatever and they hope it goes good. But if you will check your plans out with the master, you will have a much better success rate of things going well because you took the time to acknowledge that you belong to the Lord. And the truth is, if, the, if it says that we can do nothing without him, we can make real big plans and then nothing happens. So um, it's not going to happen unless God allows it to. But a living sacrifice, this is what the whole difference is, what divides the Old Testament from the New Testament. And while I do like to study and read the Old Testament, I would much prefer to spend a whole lot more time reading the New Testament because the Old Testament is the old way and we don't do it that way anymore. The Old Testament is death. The New Testament is life. You, you, you might not know it's that simple, but it is that simple. The Old Testament is death. And every time in the Old Testament, when a person sinned, they would kill an animal. That was a murderous sacrifice. Killing animals because people would kill animals because they sinned. This is why in the New Testament, God's making it clear, no more killing. Death is dead. Death is over. It says Jesus at the cross defeated death and hell. It says he conquered death and hell. How did he do it? He rose from the dead. So death is dead. So we're not supposed to be doing the dead stuff anymore. This is why God tells us to turn away from dead works. No more killing sacrifices. You're a living sacrifice. And so this is, this is good news for us. Because I don't want to kill animals. I don't even like to kill insects, honestly. I... I <laughs> have some friends is really interesting um, they had this beautiful garden they, they used to live in downtown and they had this beautiful garden of flowers and they were you know those big ones that bloom you know really huge ones and they were annoyed because there were all these insects all over the flowers so they got a bug repellent and, and they killed all the insects and then all the flowers died and they found out that those insects were actually helping keep the flowers alive with something on the internet I don't understand how all that works I don't know why the insects help keep the flowers alive but sometimes we don't we don't understand the importance of God's design that even the insects are there for a reason. And in that case, they're keeping the flowers alive. You get rid of all the insects and the flowers die. So there you go. And some people get mad because deer eat flowers, you know, but they need to eat too, right? And there's a whole lot of those around. So as we look on, how do we become a living sacrifice? The next verse says, to not be conformed to this world. Now Jesus made it very clear. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus is thinking in a completely different way. And if we are going to be able to please God, we need what's called the mind of Christ. So we can think the way Jesus does. And if you want the mind of Christ, you know, the Bible says just ask God to give you the mind of Christ. Christ. If you ask him to give you the mind of Christ, he'll do that. Um, but it's not automatic because in this world, the media and all the stuff around us, have, they have their way of doing things. It's not God's way. And we're not going to know God's way unless we seek for it. And so what has to happen? Remember I said it's all in your mind? I mean, we have the TV on this morning 
first thing was news about hurricanes. Next thing was Middle East war. And then here comes everybody's favorite, dirty politics. And it's just one negative thing after another. Negative, negative. If you spend a bunch of time watching that stuff, and I'm not saying, you know, we do need to know what's going on, but you can say, God, give me the short version. Yeah. You don't need to wallow in hours and hours of negativity and then wonder why you're depressed because it will depress you. But see, that's this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So when you go out in nature and you look at all this beautiful stuff God made, all of a sudden your mind starts to flip into the right mindset. And we start, when we see the beauty of God and the miracles of God, the everyday miracles, the sun rises, the sun sets, beautiful sunsets, beautiful forests, flowers, animals, all these gifts, we, we begin to want to worship God and praise Him and thank Him for His awesomeness, all this beautiful stuff He made. What are you focusing on? The, the glory of the Creator or all the crummy stuff that the humans are doing? And so it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so how do you renew your mind? You focus intentionally. You have to be intentional on all the good things that God's doing in your life. It says that one of the best ways to enter into the presence of God is through praise and thanksgiving. So here's the deal. Let's, let's be realistic. We're not being fake people pretending that everything is great because that's not reality. If each one of us sat down and made a list, we could say, here's a list of a bunch of things in my life that are going great. And here's a list of a bunch of stuff that is not going great. I mean, that's the reality. We have good things going on and, and negative things going on at the same time. If you're going to wait till there's no negative things going on to be happy, you will be waiting a long time. You'll have to wait till you get to heaven. <laughs> See, because... In this life, Jesus said there's going to be negative stuff, but you have a choice. Every day you get up, you have a choice of what your focus is going to be. And it says all in the Bible continually to focus on the positive, but I don't know why some people, they have a problem with that. They want to be negative. So you will get what you focus on. And if you want to be negative, you can, but I don't really think it's going to help you. So then it says, to renew your mind, so you have the mind of Christ, so that you may show what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. When you make up your mind, you're going to be positive. Nothing the devil throws at you can stop you. Nothing. I know that sounds impossible, but I have seen people in the worst circumstances with a genuine smile on their face and they're genuinely happy and they're in terrible circumstances. So you see, Jesus said, I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Which kingdom? The, his kingdom. Not this world. See, the mayor might give a key to a criminal to honor him. That's this world. But the keys of the kingdom, that's what we're talking about. He says you have the keys, but you don't, you don't get anywhere if you don't use them. So unlock the joy of the Lord. Unlock the presence of God in your heart and mind. Remember I told you we're not supposed to go around thinking more highly of ourselves? Here it is, Romans 12, 3. He says, he's warning us, 
not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly. And then we're going to wrap this up that I could go on a long, long time, but we need to wrap it up. Let's just get to the conclusion that the chapter ends with this 1221. And it says, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And the majority of the time, what he's talking about is your mind. Because see, all in this chapter, he's talking about how you think. And so you're not going to overcome evil unless you have the mind of Christ. So I'm going to give an example. There's probably not one person in this room who hasn't recently been mistreated or wronged by somebody. Has somebody done you wrong? Has somebody had somebody done somebody wrong here? Has somebody done somebody wrong? Somebody's been mistreated. Somebody's been disrespected. Dishonored. Not appreciated. Or maybe you've just been plain ignored. Disregarded. Whatever it is. What do you do when you have the mind of Christ and somebody not doing you right? You do what Jesus did. It's real simple. Really simple. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Most of the time when people are hurting other people, they're just elephants in a china shop. They just don't get it. They don't get it. And it's not your job to make them get it. It's your job to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know the people that put Jesus on the cross wouldn't have done it if they knew who he was? But they, they, you know, they messed up. You got the wrong guy here. You know, they messed up. And you know, sometimes people, they don't really know us, and they have a false view of who we are. If you want to overcome that, though, you can even pray that God would cause other people to see you in a positive light. I'll bet you probably haven't prayed that before. God, give me favor. God, cause other people to see me in a positive light. Let's say a prayer together. If you want to have a transformation, I know I do. We'll say a prayer and ask God to do it. See, the Bible's very clear about a lot of the problems we have that just keep going on and on and on and on. You say, when's this problem ever going to end? Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. A lot of times we just keep talking about the problem, but we don't ask God to do his work in the midst of the problem. Because wherever there's a problem, God's doing something. He either going to change the other person or he's going to change you. Most people are saying, change the other person. Right? That's the easy way. But let's say a prayer together. And I think it's, it's important for all of us to come to this place because I know that we want to please God. But we have to come to a place of asking for his help. Because even the ability to please God, you can't do it without his help. So let's say a prayer together and we'll ask the Lord into our hearts afresh to do a fresh work. Let's just say this with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I come to you today, right now a brand new day. Right now it's only today that matters. I invite you into my heart. And I receive the mind of Christ. I turn away from sin. I repent. Open my eyes. 
my ears, my, ears, my, heart, my heart, my mind, my mind so that I will understand your ways, so not be ignorant. Not be ignorant. Help, me, Lord, Help me, Lord, that I will do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with you, and that I will walk in faith, walk in love, and be a living sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now by faith receive it that God's going to help us to do better because he's always God is always wanting to bring us higher he's always wanting us to rise higher and so I'm going to have Kathy come up and give a few announcements and then we'll just end with a piece of music Yeah. <laughs>